The expressed views, statements, and opinions by the guests on the Risk Advisor program made either during the show or on the corresponding social media and blog outlets are not necessarily the view or opinions of Baxter Productions, Inc. or any of its affiliates, associates, or others who are part of this production. Information provided during this broadcast is for news purposes only and does not constitute a remedy for any of the discussed risks presented. Have you ever wondered about that email that you got that you just weren't sure about? Have you ever been uneasy about downloading a document? Did you ever stop and think, did you do something bad online and start to worry? We've all been there. Today we're going to hear what's happening, how it's happening, and what you can do to protect yourself online in this episode of the RiskAdvisor.com podcast. The Risk Advisor. You're listening to the Risk Advisor Vodcast. The Risk Advisor highlights topics about the most important personal security and safety issues today. This is for you, your family, and your loved ones. Experts alert to trends, tactics, and techniques used against us. You can be more aware and more informed to stay safe in this ever-changing, complicated place we call life. And now your host, media's go-to guy, Sal LaFriere. Welcome to the Risk Advisor Podcast. Today we're talking to John Bandler, the author of Cybersecurity for the Home and for the Office. We're going to talk about what people need to know to remain secure. Welcome, John. Great to be here, Sal. Thanks for having me. So, John, tell us a little about yourself. What's your background? How did you get into this? So, my background is a little bit of science in college, physics and computer science. Then I went into New York State Police for eight years, where I was a trooper in upstate New York. Went to law school at night. Got a job as a prosecutor at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, and I was there for 13 years. And I fell into this identity theft case that turned into this huge cybercrime case. I worked that for many years. And a little over three years ago, I left government service, hung out my own shingle, and now I help companies and people uh, with cybercrime protection, prevention, investigating it, help them with cybersecurity, and other security and investigations issues. You talk about being a state trooper. I got I got to take two seconds and talk about this. I was early on in my career. I had worked for mm -hmm. Office of Mental Hygiene. They had their own police. I was part of the state police, but not the troopers. And I wound up getting assigned upstate New York. And one of the places they put me was Horseheads, New York. Wow, that's and up there. Up there. I really thought they were screwing with me. I didn't think there was a Horseheads, New York. I figured they were just screwing with the young guy. Until I got in the car, drove into town, and this police car pulls up next to me, and the car it's a, there's a picture of a horse's head on the side of the car. And it's a welcome to horse heads. And I'm like, this place is real. <laughs> yeah, well, we had a facility in our patrol area, and every now and then we got called there. There was something happened there. Someone needed to be processed. So familiar with that. So we hear a lot about cybercrime, cybersecurity. Um, there, there's just tons of things that, you know, it just seems so large and overwhelming. Can you break it down a little bit? What is cybercrime? So cybercrime is a relatively new phenomenon, like the Internet is relatively new. And basically with the Internet, you have ways to communicate uh, through the Internet. And cybercrime is coming with the Internet. It allows people to commit crimes without being near you. So it used to be... Uh, if someone wanted to steal your wallet or burglarize your house, they had to be near you physically. Now with the Internet and cybercrime, uh, there's criminals all over the world. They're looking for ways to steal from us, and they can do it from another country, another city. And they're very creative in the schemes they can do, whether it's identity theft or infecting your computer, trying to steal your bank account or money you're trying to wire. So it's, it's a new phenomenon. It's a big challenge for law enforcement because of the international nature. And they're very creative. They're always adapting their scams and schemes. Basically, there's cybercrime, the cybersecurity, and then cyber information. What's, what's the difference between them? Is, is, does it really matter, or is it, just a, or is it just how it's described in general? 
So in the news, you always hear about cybercrime and cybersecurity. And then there's something else I think people should be aware of, which is information security. So cybersecurity is pretty new. That's what you hear about in the news all the time. Information security is a discipline, a profession that's been around a couple decades. When since computers started, uh, there's people looking for ways to secure those computers. So I, I always like to tell people that uh, cybersecurity and information security are ways to protect you from cybercrime and also other disasters, not just cybercrime. But if you're running a business and you have a fire or a flood and your information systems, your computers, your data is all destroyed, very bad for your business. So I like to tell people to think about information security and that cybersecurity is a part of information security. And information security is about keeping your information systems and your data um, secure. And there's basically three things to think about with information security. You should remember that the three main goals of it, uh, think CIA, but it doesn't stand for the agency. It's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So confidentiality, you want to keep your data confidential. You don't want the hackers, the intruders to get it. Integrity, you want to stop people from manipulating your data. So if you think of like a bank, imagine if they allowed an attacker to change an account balance from $10 to $10 million, or if they could manipulate uh, a transaction. And then availability, people don't think about a lot, but that's part of information security is that you want to have your systems available to you. Like I said, if there's that hurricane, earthquake, uh, terrorist attack, mm -hmm. how are you going to keep your business going? Are you going to be able to use your systems? Are you going to be able to restore your backups? People often say, you know, it, it, when we would do it from, you know, sweeps, bug sweeps, of, you know, offices and corporations, people would, you know, we would talk to people about it and they would say, you know, I, I really have nothing to hide. Is that really true? Yeah, so a lot of people say that what, to me too, like with their email account or their computers, they say, I got nothing to hide. Why do I need to secure it? If the criminal wants it, they can have it. And what I say to them is that they don't really realize what criminals can do with their email account, their social media account. So they might think that they're not talking about secrets in their email. They might not think that a criminal wouldn't want it or couldn't do anything with it. But criminals, cyber criminals, identity thieves, they're always looking for email accounts to compromise, social media accounts to compromise. They can use data and accounts and computers and ways to make money that a lot of people haven't thought of. So we really all need to secure our email accounts even if we think there's there's nothing to hide there. Real quick before we break the commercial, what are some of the more common schemes that are being run today? So, as I mentioned, cyber criminals, they're very creative. They're always looking for a new way to make money. Uh, but they're running schemes compromising email accounts, uh, hijacking funds transfers so that the f f money you're trying to wire doesn't go to where you think it's going to go. Uh, they're infecting computers with malware, and they can make money with that and also mess with your, your life. They're taking over email accounts, social media accounts. Uh, they're extorting people. They're encrypting people's computers with ransomware to extort funds. And they're running every other type of scam and con you could imagine to try get p to separate people from their money. We're going to get into a little bit more in detail about that. It was something that you come up. We're going to go to a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about the security dial and something that you know, I'd love to hear a little bit more about. With that, you were watching the Risk Advisor podcast, and we are with John Bandler, uh, the author of Cybersecurity for the Home and Office. We're talking about cybercrime, what people need to know and what they need to do to protect themselves and remain secure online. When we come back, we'll talk about the steps to remain safe in a cyber world. Workplace violence, terrorism, identity theft, cyberbullying, and stalking. It's not a matter of if they will happen, it's a matter of when. The security world is too complicated to do it alone. You need a security advisor. Call Protective Countermeasures now.
Protective Countermeasures has been providing security consulting to Fortune 500 companies for nearly 20 years. Call today, 914-576-8706, protectivecountermeasures.com. You're watching the riskadvisor.com podcast, and we're here with uh, John Bandler, author of Cybersecurity for the Home and Office. And we've been talking about cybercrime and what people need to do to remain safe and secure. So on the break, John, we were talking a little bit about, you know, different types of scams and we're talking about email and how people can become victim to an email scam. Maybe we could spend a couple minutes just chat about that. Definitely. I think the big cyber crime fraud people should know about and it involves emails is when email accounts are hacked, compromised, or impersonated. And then think about all the times we're using email to send instructions to people. And people get the email and they say, oh, I got this instruction by email, let me do it. Well, we're doing that with funds transfer instructions. So imagine, for example, you're buying a house and your attorney tells you, Sal, wire your deposit, wire the payment for the house, wire it here. And the attorney tells you to do it by email. And you get the email and you say, okay, I'm going to wire it there. You wire the money and then you realize that your attorney's email account was hacked or impersonated. So you think you're following the instructions your attorney gave you, but really you're following the instructions the cyber criminal gave you. Your money, your life savings, which you're using to buy the house, goes essentially to a cyber criminal. And they launder the money. So, you know, you wire it to a company, a person, and then that person is what's called a money mule. They're really just holding the money temporarily, and then they're going to wire it out of the country. And I think the FBI said, I don't know, $5 billion has been stolen through this scam. I've seen a lot of people lose their life savings from this. A uh, very difficult case. And businesses fall victim to this too. The controller, the accountant, the person handling the, the finances, they get an email. They think it's from their CEO. They think it's from the CFO, but really it's from a cyber criminal. So, so many people are losing money through this scam. Uh, and to protect it, we got to secure our email accounts. We can talk about that in a little bit. And also, we got to confirm instructions we get. So if someone ever sends you payment instructions, hey, wire this month's payment to this bank or our bank changed, you got to pick up the phone and you got to talk to them in person. Uh, and you got to confirm that that's really what they sent you. Well, actually, we actually had a client that had a similar issue where the CEO was out of town and they get a, a, a notice for, to the CFO saying so-and-so is going to give you a call in a little while and an email saying from the CEO, so-and-so is going to call you in a little while. You have to give him $60,000 because he's working on a deal for me and I told him you'd give it to him. And they saw it as it came from the CEO and thought it was legit. Unfortunately, the CEO had called up in the interim and he said, hey, I got your email. What email? 60000 What 60000 And And we were able to, they were able to stop that. Let's talk about the security dial. When I, when I read the book, I, I was reading through the chapters, and I see the thing about security dial, and I said, we got to talk about that. Yeah, so that's a concept I came up with for the book, uh, Cybersecurity for the Home and Office. And it's very fitting for your show on, on risk, which is that people should make a decision. What level of security do I want to have? And no one says you got to be all the way at the top, but a lot of people haven't thought about it at all, and they're basically at zero. So if you think of a dial that goes from zero, and if anyone's a fan of this is Spinal Tap, think of that dial going up to 11. So you got to decide what level of security do you want to have. I think businesses, individuals, zero, I would call negligent, but you want to raise it up. And also, you don't want to raise it up uh, too fast because when you raise your security up too fast a lot of times you end up locking yourself out of your data and out of your computers uh, it can be very frustrating so you want to learn gr make a conscious decision how secure do I need to be what threats am I facing and you know you set it somewhere and you set it somewhere across the board so it doesn't make sense if your security dial is at zero for your data and networks but you turn it up to 11 for your passwords and you know you have 
a 50 character password that you can't remember. Uh, you want something consistent across the board and that you can live with. And all of those individual steps that you would take, depending on where you want. So if you if you decided that you wanted to set it at you know at a six, obviously it's going to tell you what you need to do to remain at a six. And then if you're going to move up and move to a seven, the additional steps that you would take. Yeah, and it's a little bit of a conceptual you know feeling of you know how secure do I really need to be? How risky is you know am I a celebrity, a public figure, my business, are my clients, am I doing sensitive uh, work for clients or customers, am I holding sensitive data for customers or clients. And then, you know, another concept of the book is to look at your knowledge and awareness, your devices, meaning your computing devices, your data, where your data is, your networks, and how you access the internet. And you want to go through these. You always want to re improve your knowledge and awareness. And you want to do a little, and then you kind of want to repeat and gradually improve things, improve your knowledge. And all of this is someone who would be recognizing that there is a risk and realizing that they need to be able to do something to protect themselves. Obviously, the person who's got the head buried in the sand that says, "I have nothing to worry about. I have, you know, I have no, you know, no, no risk." Obviously, is not going to pay attention to it. But if you have any indication at all, or you have any concepts at all about the vulnerability that you have online, then it's important that you take a look at this and try and apply some of these tactics to it. Definitely, and I think. The lesson I hope people take away is that there's a cyber criminal there for everyone. In fact, there's a hundred or a thousand cyber criminals out there for everyone, even if they think they don't have risk, because that's what cyber criminals do. They're, you know, they're looking for computers and accounts and people, and the, pretty much everyone has some risk. Some people have a lot more risk. Uh, this is, this is true, and some people are just totally oblivious. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about some steps to remain safe in that cyber world. We'll be right back. From the files of New York detective Frank Santasola, the riveting murder mystery novel, The Garbage Murders. After an illicit liaison with his mistress, the owner of a private sanitation company in New York is murdered. Enter the life of Detective Frank Miranda, one of a few men in law enforcement to infiltrate the Italian mob and bring to justice some of the biggest names in organized crime history on Amazon Books in paperback and Kindle editions. TheGarbageMurders.com You're watching the Risk Advisor Vodcast, and we're back with John Bandler, author of Cybersecurity for the Home and Office, talking about cybercrime and what people need to do to remain secure. So, John, we, we talked about the security dial a little bit. Let's talk about breaking it, you know, try and break it down a little bit better to let's talk about computing devices. How do we secure a computer device? Sure. And in my book, you know, I, the book is about knowledge awareness, then talks about securing computing devices, data, networks, and Internet usage. So talking about computing devices, that's really one of the first places to start to secure yourself. And the number one rule is physically secure it. That's a part of information security. So if you lose your phone, your tablet, your laptop, if you allow uh, a criminal to have physical access to it, uh, that's an information security problem. So my first thing I tell people, try not to lose your device. Uh, have good habits where you leave it, don't leave it on the table where someone could swipe it. Next thing is have a password on your device and have it auto lock. So if someone does snatch your phone, if they do scoop up your laptop, they should not be able to just open it up and start going through it and all your data in it and the data it can access. So you, you know, you talk, you talk about passwords. I'll jump in for a sec. Talk about passwords. Uh, one of the things that people always try and they'll think about, you know, bit dates of birth or pet names or something along those lines. We had a client who actually had a major problem where um, the, let the login that she was using, the password she, she was using for her email was a pet name that a boyfriend had given her. And somebody got into it, knew it, and was able to access all of her contacts and emails and what have you. 
Any good tricks for developing a good password? My book has a trick. Now, some people recommend password managers uh, where they will put all your passwords in this uh, product and it'll give you strong passwords. But my book does have some tricks and you want to be able to remember it or you want to write it down in a book that you keep with you all the time. And you want your important online accounts to have unique passwords. So you don't want to use the same password for your LinkedIn account that you use for your email account because then if a criminal gets one, they'll get everything. So there is a way to have a system with a base of letters and characters and symbols plus something that's unique for each type of uh, password that you're accessing. Passwords are a big problem because a lot of the guidelines are unrealistic for people. A very important thing for online accounts is two-factor authentication. And that means that when you're accessing your email account or your financial account uh, or even your Facebook or LinkedIn, you're not just using a password. Uh, you're also using another factor of authentication, like proving that you have something. So, for example, you go to your email account, put your username and password in. That's something you know. That's one factor of authentication. But now when you get a one-time code to your smartphone and you have to put that in, that's proving that you also have something that greatly increases your security. So, yeah, we're talking about data now. So, after you've secured your devices, uh, password, check the updates, make sure things are updated. Don't put software on there that shouldn't be on there. Uh, check the privacy and security settings periodically. Then you want to go about securing your data. And the first thing you want to think about is where is my data? Is it on my uh, laptop, my desktop? Is it in the cloud? And then you want to think about what data is really important to you. So important in the sense of what if I lost this data? Uh, could I live with that? You might think your family photos. If you lose all your family photos, uh, that would be terrible. And then you think about what data, if it got hacked and put on WikiLeaks, uh, would be devastating for me. So you want to think about what you want to keep confidential. And then to secure your data, like I mentioned, online accounts, good passwords, and two-factor authentication, you also want to back up your data regularly. And you want to back it up securely in a way that you can restore it. So what I recommend to people is get a good external hard drive, back up your important data regularly, wherever your data is, even if it's in the cloud account, download it on the external hard drive, put that hard drive in a safe place, like a safe in your home. So I got to ask you the question. I'm totally unprepared, but I got to ask you the question. So is it kind of like, you know, the barber that needs the haircut? Do you do the same? Do you actually follow your rules and regulations? So I try very much to practice what I preach. Because I, I can tell you, for, from as a security guy, a lot of what I preach, I just don't practice. It's, yeah, <laughs> I, and I know better, and I go, I know, I should be doing this. I should be doing it, but I don't. So. so I try very hard in the book and when I talk not to set the expectations super high. So sometimes you hear advice and they say, you must do this, you must do this, you must do this. And I know that's very unrealistic for most people to do. So I try to set the advice as realistic and that it's not about being perfect, but it's about improving your knowledge and making yourself a little more secure today than you were yesterday. I want to take the last couple of minutes we have to, to actually talk about the book. Uh, when I first got it and I saw the book, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, oh, man, here's a textbook that I'm going to have to worry about reading. And I'm <laughs> like, yeah, I wasn't good at reading textbooks in school. But you get into it and you start reading it and you realize, wow, you know, this is it's, it's kind of like a page turn. There's things, there are things in here that you, boy, that's interesting. Boy, that's interesting. So when you when you decided to put the book together what was your thought how are you structuring the book what what did you really want the, the so, end user was that the desired effect yeah i structured it for the average person and the person who's a little fearful of technology a little fearful of cybersecurity not sure what to do or how to get started so that's why the book is there to educate people about the threats to educate people about privacy 
teach them. There's a chapter on how computers work in simple language, a chapter on how networks work in simple language, a, a chapter about the basics of information security. And then it takes the reader through securing their devices, data, networks. And you can do that in your home, and you should do that in your home because what's most important to all of us, our family, our home, and you can learn about it in the home because your systems are relatively small and simple. And when you've done that, then you can bring it to your workplace. So I got a chapter on how to bring it to your workplace. Uh, cover a lot of different things. I even cover uh, uh, the security of doors you might have in your office because as a state trooper, I knew some doors were easy to kick in and some doors were very hard. Uh, so it's designed to be accessible and let people know uh, as I mentioned, look, you don't have to be perfect today. You just got to learn a little, improve. And I think there are a lot of benefits. You can be not only have more confidence uh, in dealing with your systems, but also be more efficient with your technology and data and computers. Where do they get the book? They can get the book at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, uh, American Bar Association's website, lots of places. That's good. It is definitely worth a read for somebody who's not incredibly technical. Uh, being able to look through the book, read it, and understand it was really sort of important for me. And and I actually it was actually enjoyed the read. So thank you, John. Thank you for for being with us today. Uh, again, the, the the title of the book is Cybersecurity for the Home and Office. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone, if you have a question or a comment, you can write to us at guests at theriskadvisor.com, or you can follow us on our social media accounts, and you can find that link to us at all of those sites at theriskadvisor.com. We'd like to thank you again for watching, and we hope that you tune in next week. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you have any questions, would like to appear on the program, or recommend a guest, contact us at theriskadvisor.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. View and listen to us on iTunes, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and Roku TV. Tune in live on various local radio stations. Find links to all of these and listen to past shows at theriskadvisor.com. Thank you for listening. Stay safe and join us again next week for another episode of The Risk Advisor.